Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the OSHA Center for Integrative Medicine Grand Rounds. Um, as most of you know, our program alternates monthly between research seminars and uh, clinical case seminars, and this is a, a, a research month. But we're changing the format a little bit this month, and instead of having one presenter focus on one topic, we're going to showcase and highlight recipients of our Osher Center pilot uh, grant awardees. Um, and there's four of them here today. And um, what I hope you'll um, leave with is a little bit of encouragement and inspiration to uh, submit one of your own um, pilot grant applications. The letter of intents are due at the end of this month or March 1st. So hopefully you'll get inspired and see some talks. And what you'll see is that each of these presenters are talking about a new pilot study that involves interdisciplinary um, and often interinstitutional inter collaborations, which we encourage. Um, and they also target one of the key areas in our program, which have to focus on musculoskeletal health, healthy aging, cancer, and mind-body exercise therapies. Um, <clears throat> And of course, um, there's material out on the table there about our program. Um, there's material on our website. Um, but if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact us if you have concerns about how appropriate a particular project is or um, the scope or any other practical issues. We're very um, happy and encouraging you to come contact us for that information. So um, our program today is going to be organized like a little mini symposium. Uh, we want to give everyone as much time as possible, so we're going to be very precise with, with um, the transitions. Um, each of the speakers is going to talk for about 10 minutes, 10, 11 minutes, and then there'll be time for one, maybe two brief questions in between. And we're just going to keep it to that level so that we give everyone enough time to do their presentation. And then, of course, we encourage you to stay afterwards at our coffee hour and uh, bring further questions and discussions to the presenters there. Okay. So our first presenter is uh, Dr. Eric Bui. Um, and he was awarded in 2015, uh, I believe. Um, and uh, Dr. Bowie is an associate professor of psychiatry at, um, in the Harvard Medical School. And he's also the associate director of research for the, in the Center for Anxiety and Traumatic Stress Disorders at Mass General. Um, and his study is entitled, a, no a Novel Mind-Body Program for Grieving Older Adults, Development and Initial Piloting. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bowie. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me here. All right, so I'm very excited to present uh, this data on our development and initial piloting of, our, uh, of this mind-body program for grieving older adults. And just a few words about bereavement. So bereavement, uh, losing uh, a loved one, is a major life stressor. And if you think about this, it is ubiquitous. Uh, thinking about older people, uh, we have 40 million older Americans and 40% of women, as well as 13% of men, are widowed. So what happens when you lose someone close? When you lose someone close, bereavement uh, triggers a grief response. And what is a grief response? Grief response is a mix of an affective response, cognitive response, and behavioral response. So in a sense, you have emotional uh, changes uh, with uh, reactions like yearning, emotional pain, sadness. Then you have uh, different thoughts that could be negative, like guilt, regrets, shame. <clears throat> and you have um, modifications in behaviors, like including avoidance, withdrawal, isolation. And the grief response can be conceptualized as a stress response. Why? Because it's a stress response to the threat of being separated. Uh, the grief response, so data shows that the grief response involves a, a cardiovascular um, system, um, change in the cardiovascular system, in the HPA axis, and in the immune system. So bereavement, uh, as a consequence of that, bereavement impacts um, mental and physical health. With first an impact on uh, psychiatric, psychopathological uh, symptoms with in distressing and impairing symptoms of grief, traumatic stress, anxiety, and depression, as well as an impact on physical problems. For example, uh, data show um, 
an impact on limitation in daily activities, general health, pain, etc. In other words, bereavement increases mobility and increases um, health care use. There's also data showing that within the first couple of months after a loss, few months after a loss, uh, there's a peak an increase in mortality. However, to date, there's no evidence-based intervention to address the psychological, both the psychological and physical manifestation of acute grief. What you need to know is that most of the time, within the first six months, what is delivered in the community are kind of open uh, discussion support group, um, grief support group. And so we're thinking uh, that the integrative uh, a mind-body program may decrease the stress response and promote healthy grieving in the underserved population of widowed older adults. So we designed this study, uh, I apologize, it's a little bit small, but basically we had three aims. The first was to create that mind-body program that will, uh, be, uh, that will target the bereavement-related psychiatric and medical symptoms in older adults. And then the second aim was to pilot it. And we had a third aim to uh, create a paradigm to measure um, biological and physiological stress reactivity that are related to bereavement so that we could um, measure that pre and post uh, piloting. Okay. Um, so to create the intervention, we actually uh, use the, uh, the SMART 3RP, which is an intervention that has uh, been developed at a BHI, which is a three-week multimodal mind-body program that includes uh, techniques promoting relaxation response, as well as uh, elements of cognitive and behavioral skills building, and elements of positive psychology. And that SMART3RP uh, has been developed to help individuals cope with chronic stress. So we thought maybe that intervention will work well with older adults who lost their spouse. So why? Here you can see on your left a list of uh, problems uh, that um, when looking into the literature, uh, we found that uh, older adults who lost their spouse uh, reported uh, stress response, loneliness, lack of social support, unhealthy behaviors, negative thoughts, connection, negative effects. And so we looked at the SMART uh, program components and so that different sessions of this program will uh, target well these different uh, potential targets. Okay. So uh, the first study we did uh, was to ensure that the SMART program will be uh, very fit and will to adapt it to, uh, to the needs of other adults um, who lost their spouse. And we also wanted to address the efficacy implementation gap. So what is that gap? What is it? Well, often, so sometimes, often, uh, uh, people develop an intervention, then they test the efficacy, and then it works well, and then they try to implement it, and people in the community don't understand the manual, the terms they use, uh, they drop key components because they don't exactly get it. And so what we wanted to do is from the treatment development include uh, potential um, provider and users. So, in, so we did the focus group study both among older adults who lost a spouse, asking them for their feedback on the program, and uh, among community providers. Okay? And so the aim was each time to evaluate feasibility, acceptability of the program, and uh, to uh, get their feedback to adapt the program to the specific needs of these two populations. Uh, so we did the focus groups, the audio tape, transcribe, and did content analysis. Uh, this is a summary of the two population we got. Uh, the focus group were a little bit smaller in size, but we had uh, nine widowed other adults and seven community providers. So community providers included chaplains, uh, social workers, bereavement coordinators, volunteers. 
Oh, one last thing. The, uh, so the, uh, so to, in order to get people who were experienced, the community providers had uh, to, be, uh, to have at least five years of experience with these populations. And as you can see that on average 20 years of experience. Uh, so what did we ask them specifically? We asked them already. Okay, we asked them for uh, their perspective on uh, on the stress after losing a spouse in older age, and so they reported pretty much what we were expecting: emotional, psychological distress, lack of social support, role challenges, lack of self-care. And then we asked them what they thought of the program. So we went through the program with them, each session, showing them uh, what it contained. And each time they said that it was relevant, they, uh, they thought that it was acceptable, feasible, and they did report some barriers. Um, so overall, all of our most of our participants thought that it was logical, the program was logical, that it would be helpful, and that they would be willing to participate in it or to implement it. Okay. So based on all their feedback, we uh, adapted the manual. And then we did our second study, which was to pilot it. So we did an open pilot in, among six older widowed adults. Uh, on average, they had, uh, there were 71, uh, two thirds were women, and they had lost a spouse about seven months ago, on average. Um, the, uh, the level of, of grief was relatively high, so 30 on this measure uh, is a cutoff for significant grief and they received the eight weekly sessions. So what did we find? In terms of pre-post changes, we found large uh, improvement in psychiatric symptoms, in somatic symptoms, and large improvement in quality of life. Uh, we also uh, looked at certain pot potential mechanism of change, and we also found uh, large changes, effect sizes and changes in uh, perceived social support. That was one of our uh, positive targets and health promoting lifestyle. So just a couple, uh, just a couple slides to show the magnitude of the change. As you remember, our third aim was to look at stress reactivity, uh, to create a paradigm to measure bereavement related stress reactivity. So we created that paradigm and then we assess pre to post uh, changes uh, the stress reactivity during uh, a recollection of a death, during listening to a story of the death. And we found a uh, small to medium uh, FX size in terms of changes in skin conductance, response, heart rate, and EMG. In next steps, we have uh, a, and we're trying to get another group running uh, as soon as uh, it's getting a little bit warmer. And we have submitted a recent uh, grant to the DOD to um, try to compare our intervention to grief support groups. And thank you very much. So thank you, that was perfect. And I think it just articulates a perfect example of how these pilot programs can really develop very important building blocks to validate the intervention, to get some preliminary data, um, to get some publications out um, that really uh, set you in a good position for for moving forward with future grants. There's time for one or two questions. Anyone have one for Dr. Bui? Yeah. Uh, you've been experiencing culture shock on the team in your further studies with the larger population size. So can you repeat the question? Actually, so actually I couldn't hear the question. <laughs> Uh, not we, we haven't planned on that. Like you mean culture, like race, ethnicity, and how they yeah, will impact. How, how the deal with uh, not yet. There's there's actually not that much data on that, and most of the research that has been done on grief hasn't accounted too much for the variance in culture. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Thank you Thank so you. much. <clears throat> So our next presenter is Dr. Kristen um, Schreiber, um, and she's also a 2015 awardee. Uh, Dr. Schreiber is an assistant professor in medicine, and, um, and her translational research, which is based at Brigham Women's, is largely focused around the broad concept of pain. Uh, her presentation today um, is <laughs> um, focused on yoga 
and um, and chronic pain. I don't know. And fibromyalgia. Here she goes. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Schreiber. All right. Well, thanks so much for um, coming and listening, and um, I'll try to keep it in time. Um, so as Peter said, I'm in the Department of Anesthesiology, Perioperative and Pain Medicine. I sort of have a background in neuroscience, um, more of the basic mechanisms, what causes chronic pain. Um, but then as I got into anesthesia and watched the differences between people and how they react to pain, I got more and more interested in psychological or sort of phenotypic differences between people, and I've been looking at chronic post-surgical pain. One thing I noticed in my own life is that when I exercise, I feel better, I have less pain, and so I thought, can I you know, bring this to a group of people that has a lot of pain and may be afraid of moving because of their pain? So we're just, uh, so we looked at the impact of daily yoga-based exercise and fibromyalgia. We had a hard time coming up with an acronym, but it's asana, and we're really looking at the um, interactions between sleep, um, neuroendocrine response, and pain. Um, so, and I don't have any disclosures. I don't know if that's relevant or not. Anyhow, um, I want to first introduce um, the team. We really had a nice group of co-investigators from Beth Israel, Spalding, um, of course here at Brigham, psychologists, rheumatologists, physical therapy, um, sleep specialists, um, and so those people all kind of contributed to the design of this and trying to look at lots of different aspects of exercise and how it affects pain. Mina Lazaridu was our yoga instructor, so she's trained in yoga, has gone to India and, and studied, um, so she's the real expert in that. And has um, since she's involved in pain, she's good at really adapting it to people with pain. Um, and Alexandra and Anna really helped make this study run. It was logistically challenging to get people together in a class, um, especially fibromyalgia patients. So um, a little bit about fibromyalgia. You're probably pretty familiar with this. It really embodies the biopsychosocial model of pain in that there are so many different aspects to it. I'm interested in pain, but what we find even in the larger population is that affective components and sleep disturbance impact pain. And so really fibromyalgia do have, they have augmented pain processing, oftentimes multiple body sites that are painful. Um, they have more negative affect than maybe your average person and certainly as much as most chronic pain patients, if not more. Um, they have a great degree of sleep disturbance, which probably contributes to that. Importantly, a lack of effective pharmacologic treatments. This is maybe good for fibromyalgia patients. They don't get put on opiates very often. <laughs> um, but really, there's not a great, they don't have a lot of great options. So um, notably, they have lower physical fitness. It's estimated, um, one study looked at sort of the physical fitness of an average 40-year-old with fibromyalgia, and they're equivalent to a 70-year-old without fibromyalgia. And they report not only less intense physical activity, but less mild and moderate activity as well. And a couple of small studies had shown that some moderate frequent exercise could improve the quality of life for people with fibromyalgia. So that was sort of the background. Um, and so how are we gonna get people with fibromyalgia who have a lot of pain moving? And so we settled on yoga for a number of reasons. There were a couple of small studies that suggested that home yoga could be beneficial to these patients, and then um, even a, a twice weekly yoga class um, showed, at least in this small study, um, an impact on the cortisol awakening response, which is disrupted in people with fibromyalgia. So, um, and you may think that people with fibromyalgia won't want to participate in yoga, but in fact, this international internet based questionnaire. Um, showed that at least 80% of people had considered trying yoga, and more than half had even come to a yoga class at some point. So they were, at least there are some people with fibromyalgia who are receptive to this. Importantly, they had some concerns about the poses being too stren strenuous um, and making their pain worse. So we really tried to take that into account in coming up with um, a, a yoga intervention. So basically we had them come six weeks, once a week, and it was Satyananda Yoga, which included asanas, breathing practices, and meditation as part of each of those two-hour classes. Um, 
it was very slow, kind of gentle teaching with a lot of modifications and discussion about how to modify for pain. Um, and then we made these kind of homemade videos, but it was the same instructor, Mina, um, and each week sort of focused on poses and meditations that we had done in class that week. So it's very much um, like a kind of a homegrown thing, and Mina was wonderful. Um, our study questions really were kind of basic question, are the symptoms of fibromyalgia, including pain, sleep, and affect, improved with daily yoga? And then we wanted to look at some of these interactions, the uh, sleep, stress, and pain. How are they related within fibromyalgia? And does this relationship um, you know, go through the HPA axis? The, as the one study suggested, there was actually an improvement of the cortisol awakening response. Um, and does this change with yoga uh, when people actually get some movement and some exercise each day? We're interested in psychosocial um, factors and how they intersect with pain, and so we wanted to see if these were related to symptom improvements, since this is a big part of fibromyalgia pain. And then we wanted to see whether basic pain processing was changed by yoga. So we have a quantitative sensory testing lab where we deliver, you know, defined painful stimuli and can, in a more systematic way, look at how people are processing pain. So these are the inclusion and exclusion criteria. I'm not gonna go through them in um, great detail, but basically they had to have fibromyalgia diagnosis um, per the Wolf criteria, a pretty mm, severe average pain and sleep disturbance. Uh, since all of our phenotypic measures are in English, they had to be English speaking also because Mina doesn't speak Spanish. So, um, And we collected a lot of our data through the REDCap system, so they, they were, um, basically answering questions through that. Um, anything that physically would keep them from being able to do yoga or um, really severe psychological um, things. So um, this is, these are sort of the study measures that we used for measuring pain, sleep, stress. Um, we did have them wear ACTA watches um, and um, did this cortisol, celebrate cortisol collection we did the QST testing, as I mentioned, um, and it was basically we're taking at baseline during week two of yoga and week six, so like basically kind of densely measuring all the things at three different time points as they're going through and doing yoga. So um, we got 46 people to participate in five different sessions of six weeks, and so it ended up being seven to 10 in a class, and um, three quarters of the people actually completed it in a meaningful way. We got all the measures from them, which is <laughs> quite a triumph, actually. Um, this is just some of their demographics, um, baseline pain and sleep disturbance, a pretty high degree of catastrophizing, just for reference in mastectomy patients, which I also study, the average catastrophizing score is five. So, um, and higher than average anxiety and depression. That's pretty typical of fibromyalgia. Some very preliminary analysis, and I purposely left all the variability in here so you could see it, um, but we did have a decrease in pain from the baseline to the six-week time point, um, both the average sort of daily diaries and the BPI. Um, as you can see, high variability between individuals, and um, most people are going down, but there were a few people who went up, so just of note. Um, and so what accounts for this variability? We started to look a little bit about this. So they also reported how much yoga they're doing on this x-axis is number of minutes in a six-day period. So basically the more yoga they were doing, the greater their decrease in pain. Um, and if we dichotomize this, people who were doing greater than 25 minutes a day actually got a benefit, whereas those who were doing less um, did not. Um, some decrease in, in sleep disturbance and fatigue and, um, a, in, and sleep latency. Again, variable between individuals. We're working on a qualitative paper, which should hopefully be published soon. Um, but this was noted by some people as an important benefit. Um, I wanted to just briefly mention the psychosocial impact. So we did see a decrease in the catastrophizing scores. Um, and 
again, this sort of correlated with the degree of improvement in fibromyalgia symptoms. So as their PCS is going down, their symptoms of fibromyalgia are also decreasing. Um, but again, quite a bit of variability amongst participants. One other kind of interesting note is that um, people did really feel like they got a lot of social support out of this, um, and the, the more social support they perceived, the more their catastrophizing score went down. So I think that's kind of an interesting interaction, and many people really mentioned this. One last thing is um, this distraction analgesia, which is part of our quantitative sensory testing. People come in and have a painful stimulus, and then basically they were better able to distract themselves away from this painful stimulus. Um, so in the future, we're really gonna be digging into more of these and looking at the relationships between the variables um, with our actigraphy and cortisol. Um, and potentially look at, looking at mediational relationships. And as you saw, there's some people who responded better, so we really wanna try to phenotype and say, who is this gonna work for so that we can give that information. So thank you very much for your attention. So another fabulous talk and really a beautiful biopsychosocial framework for studying a complex chronic uh, issue. Um, it's time for one brief question. Yes, up here. On the yoga intervention, you listed meditation, but you put in brackets yoga nidra. Was that the only meditation practice, or was there another formal sitting meditation within the yoga practice, or did you? No, it was the. It was just was the. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was. Was there any meditative component during the yoga itself? In other words, instructing the participants to pay attention to the process or to their sensory input while they were doing the yoga practice. Yes, I, I would say yes. I mean, definitely she did refer back to that. And probably with a little bit more specific um, reflection back on fibromyalgia pain, you know, asking participants to think back on their own normal pain and how this practice was impacting it. Okay, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And anybody here who's done mind-body studies know it's no small feat to recruit close to 50 people in a short period of time, so that's really impressive. Um, our third presenter today is Dr. Olivia Okurake, Um and she's one of our 2017 recipients. Um, Dr. Okurake is an associate professor of psychiatry and also of epidemiology at both the Harvard Medical School and the Harvard uh, Chan School of Public Health. Um, and she's the Director of Geriatric Psychiatry at MGH, among other um, responsibilities. And today, she's going to be talking about uh, a more um, combination of epidemiology and molecular biology in terms of uh, wellness and health. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kerrick. <laughs> Thank you. So as Dr. Wayne mentioned, uh, this is a relatively recently awarded project. So we are still in progress, but there's been a fair amount that we can show you. So this is a, a study looking at um, a pilot study, looking at the relation of DNA methylation and other molecular markers as they relate to health and well-being and aging. And I just wanted to point out there are no disclosures, but there are important funding sources. The OSHER pilot, of course, was fundamental um, to this project, but there are a number of other projects that were funded that um, uh, involve collaborators across um, institutions here at Harvard and that made um, some of the other work possible. In particular, I wanted to point out a co-PI on the project, Dr. Aditi Hazra, who's at the Brigham, and uh, there are other key collaborators as well, including the division chief where Dr. Hazra is, Dr. Joanne Manson, who is the PI of a trial called The Vital, which I'll describe briefly, as well as so many other uh, staff, um, both in the laboratories and in the chronic disease epidemiology uh, areas at the Channing Division of Network Medicine, the Division of Preventive Medicine, um, and the Partners Personalized Medicine Corps. So we're particularly interested in how social factors may influence um, aging on physical dimensions of aging and whether or not stress is something that we can observe measurably makes the body age faster, if you will. 
in that we wanted to interrogate what are the mechanisms whereby we can identify a kind of biological readout in the system that connects mental and physical aging um, and understand what are the best molecular markers that may describe healthy versus adverse aging in human beings. So our goal with this pilot was actually very straightforward. We wanted to pilot a very new genome-wide DNA methylation technology, a new platform that could be used and applied to develop a epigenetic aging measure. Uh, and the idea would be we would develop this measure and then we would also compare it to other well-known putative molecular markers of aging in order to look at this relationship between stress and aging, in particular for this pilot to look at the relation between social stress, psychosocial stress, and epigenetic age. So briefly, um, there are a number of well-known putative markers of molecular aging, and these include things like telomere length and mitochondrial DNA copy number. So telomere length, we think, um, has been shown in most studies to shorten um, with exposure to certain kinds of stresses. Um, including psychosocial stress and oxidative stress. Mitochondrial DNA copy numbers are a little bit different because we hypothesize that what we would see is actually an increase because mitochondrial DNA compared to nuclear DNA is something that um, tends to ramp up um, with exposure to oxidative stress or DNA damage um, agents because of the fact that mitochondrial DNA don't really have any intrinsic repair mechanism, unlike nuclear DNA. So we identified a sample of people who were part of this trial called the vitamin D and omega-3 trial. It's a large, simple trial of heart disease and cancer primary prevention. But there are several participants in the study in whom we have ancillary funding to look at a range of psychosocial factors and also psychosocial social outcomes. So preliminarily, we were looking at other uh, markers of aging that we wanted to ultimately compare to our new DNA methylation. So for example, as expected, um, as shown in the left half of the graph, we see a negative or inverse association between chronological age and telomere length. So that's what we expect to see. We also see that a prominent uh, uh, precipitant of oxidative stress, which is cigarette smoking, is associated with more telomere shortening, um, such that people who have um, a history of uh, current smoking have more telomere shortening compared to never or past in terms of the slope of the age-related telomere shortening. And we also were very interested in understanding are there biological sex differences or race ethnic differences, and that's a later part of this project that we want to be able to do as we expand to larger sample sizes. But we see, as expected in our data that um, has been reported elsewhere, women tend to have longer telomeres actually than men, but we don't see any differences in terms of the slope of change. And also, um, African American participants have longer telomere lengths in general than um, uh, non-Latino white participants, but we don't see that there's any significant evidence of faster shortening over time. Um, but overall, this is just a summary just to show what we find with these existing um, measures of telomere length and mitochondrial DNA copy number. Essentially, what it reveals is that there are a lot of conflicting findings. Um, so with, when it comes to chronological age and, and telomeres, we see the inverse association. We didn't really see that with mitochondrial DNA copy number. For depression, we saw no association for telomere length in our pilot data, which is relatively smaller. But we did see a bit of a signal, but only in men. Um, for mitochondrial DNA copy number. Smoking was the only one that was consistently associated with these outcomes, but they differed in terms of the signal magnitude being larger among women with telomeres, larger among men with mitochondrial DNA copy number. Exercise was actually in opposite directions than we might have expected, where we see longer telomeres for people who exercise more, although the signal was stronger, stronger in, um, or in um, non-minorities. And we see that there's actually um, an unexpected um, inverse association for exercise with mitochondrial DNA copy number. And this is something that has been observed elsewhere, that the associations are not with mitochondrial DNA copy number as expected with typical aging stress exposures. And with alcohol, again, we saw some, um, some differences in the association. So what about these differences? It may be that contrary to a lot of the buzz out there, these markers, telomeres, mitochondrial DNA copy number, may not perform equally well as proxies of biological aging. Some of what we might be identifying is that they might also not be uh, 
uh, similarly performing among diverse groups of people, men versus women, um, and among different racial ethnic minorities. We're very interested in epigenetic age because this is something that may be more precise. It directly addresses gene expression since epigenetic changes involved in gene expression and has been strongly related to biological age with much higher correlation has been seen with other markers and mortality. So for our pilot, our goal was to pilot the platform. That's the first and most important thing, is testing the feasibility and performance of our platform in our data. The particular platform we're using is a brand new 850K from Illumina. In fact, it's so new that there hadn't even been published uh, uh, literature on essentially how to do the bioinformatics preprocessing steps. So we borrowed from the existing platform, which is the 450K, um, in order to run um, all of this. Um, but we had a, a sample from our study that had completed comprehensive in-person psychiatric interviews, multiple psychosocial in, um, measures. We had uh, half were men, half were women, um, half were uh, psychiatric cases, half were controls. And they were balanced um, across the age spread about 50 to 80 years, so we get a good signal. Um, and we also had an internal lab control sample. So our primary goal is to make sure that this platform works in the the DNA that we've extracted from whole blood. The first step, identifying that we can read in the data, um, run the pre-processing uh, steps of normalization and background correction, which uh, reduces variability um, within and between person variability so that we don't have unwanted variability affecting sa uh, the sample analysis at later steps. And we have a good quality plot. And also something we should be able to do as a fundamental QC step is use the methylation output to show that we can identify the biggest source of variation, which is male versus female. So what we can see from this curve is that we can perfectly separate out X and Y chromosome, or Y chromosome containing versus not. Um, this also includes an internal lab control sample, which is blinded to us, and which the lab runs to confirm that there was successful genotyping and that we identify the control as female sex. Also, we want to be able to sh uh, show that there's a predictable uh, distribution of these intensities. So essentially what goes on is that these sites across the genome are methylated predominantly or unmethylated, kind of like an on-off, if you will. So what you expect to see is a bimodal distribution of predominantly unmethylated and predominantly methylated. And that's what we see across these more than 850,000 CPG dinucleotide sites. So finally, we wanted to be able to compare um, the results in our sample from in-house CBCs versus the estimated cell counts, which is a critical piece that later is used for DNA methylation analysis. And what we see is that we had an excellent performance in terms of identifying the cell populations, lymphocytes, granulocytes, and monocytes from our DNA with what's actually measured concurrently in these same people as they came into the hospital in the in the in hospital lab for CBC complete blood count. So that was very good to see. So essentially what do we want to do now? Our last step is we want to we want to complete this analysis of the the DNA methylation age which we actually need to adapt using the new technology because of the fact that there's some CPG sites that don't overlap with the existing calculator. Um, so that's a piece that we're working on finalizing. But in terms of the um, next steps, we're already moving on. Um, we know that this platform works. So we've been able to use this data to apply for um, a foundation. Um, and we're also very interested in um, uh, working with others on stress, aging, and alternative therapies um, in this exciting um, population that we work with uh, because we have the opportunity here with the vital study population to look at how alternative treatments like vitamin D, fish oil, may actually change DNA methylation prospectively. That is something we're using this pilot data to do with the application that we just submitted for a foundation. So. another fabulous presentation and a really nice example of how these pilot grants can be used to develop biomarkers to piggyback already existing large-scale epi projects like the vital study but then use those to inform um, tools that can be used in prospective prevention studies so really fabulous example um, there's time for a question
voice back. So Olivia, this is uh, this is amazing work. What's going to happen next? I mean, where is this where is this taking us? Oh yeah, well, um, so as I mentioned, there are actually treatments that are out there, particularly fish oil, um, that we think may have some healthy aging intervention potential. Um, so the fact that we already have this existing work we've been doing for the last, at this point, seven years, collecting psychosocial measures and outcomes in vital, um, as well as serial measures of uh, DNA, um, means that we can actually look at an experimental framework at whether or not long-term use of these agents produces changes in these, uh, these molecular markers of aging, specifically DNA methylation age. Great, thank you very much. And, um, I have a uh, question to clarify. Um, I don't think people know the scope of the vital study, but can you just tell us the sample size? Sure, that? so we, we piloted this in a group of about just over a thousand people who are clinic, in clinic, uh, subjects who get the detailed in-person live interviews and blood collection and so forth. But these are a subset of almost 26,000 people all over the country who are part of a large simple trial that's been ongoing for seven years. So it's a definitive test of long-term exposure to vitamin D and fish oil and health outcomes, specifically heart disease and cancer, but a variety of other out ancillary outcomes, including depression that we're funded to look at. Um, so what this means is we pilot this and we show this very excellent performance. This means we can take DNA from people who might not have come in house, but we know we can estimate cell counts and do those other things that we need to do for the analytic steps. So we know that this is something that we can use among, say, the 17,000 people on whom we've already extracted DNA all over the country. So it, it does mean a lot that we can do this and then extrapolate it beyond. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So our final uh, presenter today is Dr. Amit Anand, and he's also a 2017 awardee. And uh, Dr. Anand um, is an instructor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School, and he's a member of the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at BIDMC. Um, and his work uh, centers around sleep and pulmonary function and yoga, uh, yoga breathing, pranayama, and I think he's also a teacher and pra long-term practitioner of pranayama practices. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Anand. Thank you, Peter. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm going to focus uh, the next 10 minutes uh, on breathing, um, aspects of breathing that uh, relate to disease, a technique that is used to actually study breathing control, and the practice of pranayama, which is uh, a many thousand year old tradition of uh, extension of breath to enliven the energetic principle behind the act of breathing. Um, as one wise New Yorker said many years ago, for us, winning isn't the only thing, it's second only to breathing. And it extends across the spectrum of my practice since I'm in the ICU. I see patients in the pulmonary setting and I'm also a sleep physician. Uh, I wanted to introduce this uh, problem of high loop gain chemosensitivity sleep apnea, which was actually coined by Dr. Thomas, who was in the audience today. Uh, this is a subset of patients with obstructive sleep apnea that have heightened chemosensitivity, such that their physiology is non-REM dominant as opposed to REM dominant disease. They have these short cycle length events accompanied by periodic fluctuations in oxygen and CO2 that result in electroencephalographic arousal, accompanied by surges in blood pressure and heart rate. It's a challenge to treat these patients, and the phenotype is one <clears throat> where they have heightened chemosensitivity, which results in sustained sympathoexcitation. And as a result of sustained sympathoexcitation, there are these pervasive systemic effects, uh, blood pressure, metabolic syndrome, contributions to endothelial dysfunction, mood disorders such as anxiety, and fatigue. And they classically tend to have a very poor response to the treatment we use for sleep apnea, which is CPAP. They tend to have also a lot of fragmented sleep, disproportionate to the effects of sleep apnea, and it's thought to be by virtue of this hyper-responsive respiratory chemoreflex. This is the dilemma. It's an extreme challenge for us as sleep physicians, and it's extremely frustrating to the patient that you put them on CPAP and you get this pattern of breathing. Uh, this is actually a flow waveform from a CPAP machine where we can actually interrogate to see how the patient is doing on positive airway pressure therapy. And you see this periodic fluctuation, hyperventilation, hypoventilation, hyperventilation, hypoventilation. So 
The patient's not snoring. The patient has an open airway, but the patient is still having a residual periodic breathing and sleep fragmentation uh, despite treatment of obstruction, i.e., you've exchanged obstructive physiology for central physiology. So this almost akin to chain Stokes ventilation. That's the extreme form of ventilation, which you see in heart failure patients, but this is almost akin to that. It's characterized by resting hypocapnia, heightened uh, uh, sympathetic nerve activity, uh, blood pressure issues, and insomnia despite the use of CPAP. So where does yoga come in? This is a shout out to a couple of papers dating back to the 70s and 80s. One was actually from here. It's talking about meditation in TM practitioners characterizing their physiological state, which was wakeful and hypometabolic, i.e., one that is accompanied by mental clarity, but autonomic calm. So when people who practiced transcendental meditation were studied, they had resting lower blood pressures, resting lower heart rates, resting lower ventilation, decreased oxygen uptake, decreased cortisol, and decreased epinephrine and norepinephrine levels. But the study that was of particular interest to me was this one that came out in Belgium on advanced practitioners of Hatha Yoga. So these people had been practicing for many, many years, not only a Hatha Yoga practice, which involves a body-based practice, but emphasis on breath, on pranayama, on breath control. And when you look at their physiology in terms of their breathing, it's characterized by large tidal volume, slow respiratory rate ventilation as opposed to normal tidal ventilation, which is 10 to 12 breaths per minute, half a liter in volume. And that comes by in elevations in resting PCO2, which may have therapeutic implications in the sleep apnea population that I'm looking at. When you expose these patients to CO2, which is a measure of your central chemo reflex, their slopes are actually attenuated, so that CO2 is a prime mover of respiratory drive. When you expose them to CO2, just pure CO2, which is what the central chemo sensors are responding to, their slope is actually attenuated. How do you actually do this? This is actually one of the outcomes of our study. It's the modification of the Reed's rebreathing index, where you get them on a bag, you open them up to a circuit, which is 95% oxygen. So it's hyperoxia, but 5% CO2. So you're eliminating the effects of hypoxia on the peripheral chemo sensors. You're basically stimulating them to CO2 5 to 7%, and thereby generating this graph in that patient. You do it for about a four minute exposure, <clears throat> such that mixed venous, alveolar, and bag CO2 equilibrate, and then you plot ventilation as opposed to the CO2 graph until they reach four minutes of time or a certain entitled CO2. And that's the graph that you get in terms of ventilation versus CO2. We hoped that in those patients with complex sleep apnea that were going to be exposed to the IBAM protocol, which is integrated yogic breathing and meditation, we would reduce the slope of this response, thereby having them become less hypocapnic during sleep and perhaps better able to equilibrate to CPAP. Two, we would improve stable breathing during sleep as assessed by the M1 cardiopulmonary coupler, as well as sleep quality as assessed by sleep questionnaires. We also hoped that this would affect nocturnal blood pressure. We think these patients actually non-dip uh, at night because of their respiratory control issues and sustained sympatho excitation. And the last outcome was to look at vigilance, attention, and information processing speed on a smartphone 15-minute based app. The study design was to recruit and randomize 20 such patients to have them studied at baseline in terms of their ventilatory responses to CO2, that's the HCVR, their M1 cardiopulmonary coupling, the DANA app, blood pressure, and sleep questionnaires, and then randomize them to a three-month intervention of integrated yogic breathing pranayam and meditation. And I would be the one who's actually teaching them. I teach them on the weekends every two weeks so as to inform their practice, and then build up on their practice. And the pace breathing group would get a metronome-based um, app so, so as to um, continue this practice at home, and we, I would meet up with them once a month. At the end of three months, we would restudy them 
and then have them cross over such that the pace breathing group would then be exposed to the intervention just like I was doing for the first group. And the IBAM group had the choice to either extend their practice or to stop to really assess if there was a washout in terms of some of these outcomes. The patients that we have so far recruited, we have had about 10 patients come into our uh, study group, all with non-REM dominant sleep apnea, i.e. a 3% AHI of greater than 15 per hour, uh, certain characteristic features uh, on their sleep studies, and uh, criteria on their waveform morphology when using CPAP that informs periodic breathing. What is pranayam? Pranayam is an ancient science. Um, it's an aspect of uh, hatha yoga. Uh, the practice that I teach comes from the Kaivaladham school of yoga based in Lunavla, India. Um, and it emphasizes a lot of work on nostril breathing and prolonged exhalation. Not only is the volume of air that is moved with breath important, it's not just yogic breathing, but it's empowered thoracic breathing, wherein you actually move breath by entraining the lower abdominal muscles and empowering the upper chest. And it's more than just a series of exercises in hyper and hypoventilation. So the very specific techniques to, to create a sense of clarity and then autonomic calm. Kapal Bhati is the breath of fire. This is an energizing practice. It's thought to be a preparatory practice in uh, the Patanjali tradition of yoga. This is then followed by the Ujjayi practice of breathing. For those of you who've taken yoga classes, you're probably very familiar with Ujjayi, which is slow tidal volume, forced tidal volume ventilation, slow vital capacity ventilation. And one can see that <clears throat> with this kind of maneuver, you have uh, enhanced respiratory sinus arrhythmia and phase entrainment of sympathetic nerve activity. And we finally conclude with uh, mantra meditation as a part of uh, the practice. Uh, pranayam also emphasizes sound um, with each breath. And mantra meditation, uh, this is very similar to TM. Uh, this is also what I'm instructed to teach them, uh, which concludes their practice either in the morning or in the evening for about five to ten minutes. I'll close with a beautiful um, aphorism from the Upanishads, which is a yogic wisdom a tradition book, which speaks to the value of why we use sound. Um, the essence of earth, which is the subtle aspect of earth, is water. The essence of water is plants. The essence of plants is the human being. The essence of human beings is speech. The essence of speech is thoughts, words, and ideas. The essence of thoughts, words, and ideas is sound. The essence of sound is primordial sound or mantra, mantra without sound without meaning. And the essence of primordial sounds or mantras is pure awareness itself. Even though we've lost some, <clears throat> I would still like to conclude in gratitude to my teacher, Sri Opi Tiwari, my colleague and mentor, Robert Thomas, Andrew Taylor, our study coordinator, Jacqueline Fung, and of course, to the Osher Institute of Integrative Medicine. Thank you. Another fabulous presentation, and, and also reflecting people who can bridge disciplines, very traditional practices, and a very sophisticated appreciation of the complexities of pulmonary physiology and, and, um, and the promise of some of these um, less orthodox interventions for, for solving some complex problems. So it's a really lovely presentation. So it's time for some questions for Dr. Anand. Why don't we start with Helen and, um, and then oh, go ahead, Dr. So you had them practicing six breaths per minute largely. I mean, what was the mix of pranayama practices? Was it mostly slow breathing, or was it Kapalabhati as well as? So Kapalabhati in this tradition, as you would know, is a preparatory practice. We start with the bandhas, and uh, we sort of conclude with Kapalabhati as a preparatory practice. But then it's six out of the eight pranayama practices out of the Patanjali tradition of yoga. We don't do Surya and Chandra Bhedana, but we teach them Ujjayi, we teach them Bhastrika, uh, we teach them some variation of Brahmari also. So it's six breathing practices, but the emphasis is really on breath. The practice from beginning to end is between 20 and 25 minutes, and the meditation sort of concludes uh, the sequence. Five so minutes. the majority is slow, slow breathing frequency? Uh, I mean, exhale to inhale, two is to one, depending okay. upon there, yeah. And do you notice a different, have, have you recorded whether these changes take place in their breathing rate at night? 
when they're sleeping. So we've just... Is the respiratory rate lower. Yeah, so we've just concluded the first um, three months of the initial group. That's going to happen right now. We've not recorded them at night at home while using CPAP. Mm. We look at their waveforms if we happen to see them in clinic. Uh, but that's not actually, you know, part of the study design. I mean, we'll look at them post three months in terms of the respiratory waveforms on PAP. There's a question up there. So we can measure the breathing rate quite easily from the CPAP machine as well as the... Uh, uh, we can measure the breathing rate quite easily from the CPAP machine uh, during periods of stable breathing. Uh, what you saw was a period of unstable breathing, but typically the average person has both going back and forth. Thus, the cardiopulmonary coupling uh, technology can generate uh, a respiratory rate also during sleep. So we will have that information. I had a question. So uh, these are your patients in the laboratory, or they're recruited from a sort of population, and you work with them individually. So I, uh, I mean, time is a premium, so yeah. I have to teach them on weekends because I do a lot yeah. of other work clinically. Um, the group is about four to five strong. Uh, so there's that group consciousness also. Okay, so and then it's a 90-minute practice, you know, every other Saturday. Okay, uh, so that you assemble a group. Assemble a group, people exactly. People keep rolling in and out depending no. on... No, so uh, as of now, it's just the first group that has been randomized to the IBAM mm -hmm. and then the first group. So that will cross over now at the mm -hmm. end of this month. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and my question is, um, qualitatively, what is their response to this? So these are people who have con complex issues. They're probably not very healthy or have some health issues, and then they come in on a Saturday and do some fairly specific and somewhat esoteric breathing practices. What's your gestalt on, on their um So I'm very excited. I mean, the it. spectrum of age is ranges from 40 to 81 in this group. And I will say at week uh, four, that is the third session, two of them actually got their spouses to join. And I said, you can't do this, you know. <laughs> this is pure science. But they were so excited about what was happening. So it's actually quite uh, reassuring. Yeah. Well, that, that excites me in terms of bridging traditions and cultures. And I think, you know, we're, we're trying to look for provocative questions. And I think this is a really nice example of East meets West yeah. and, and uh, exploring that in a very rigorous way. So thank you. Um, one last quick question for Dr. Nan. Thank you, that was excellent. Um, do you have any information on use of sleep medicines as re in relationship to the uh, increased um, proficiency in using breathing techniques? Sleep medication? Yes. Such as sleep stabilizers, such as uh, Ambien, Lunesta, over-the-counter sleeping aids, etc. Maybe I'm thinking more about insomnia than, yeah. but you know, sleep difficulties, poor quality sleep. Yeah, so we, we exclude them. For anyone who's actually using something to help deal with insomnia. As a part of this study, we exclude them because we don't want to have it affect their ventilatory response. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, please join me in thanking all the speakers one more time. Thank you. And um, as you know, there's a coffee hour re reception or coffee reception out um, just to the right. Uh, a couple yards down the hallway and then to the left, uh, you'll see that. And there's an opportunity there, I hope, to um, engage with the presenters and, um, and also with our staff if you have any questions about our program. Again, to remind you, um, the letters of intent for our next cycle are due on March 1st. If you have any questions, send us emails. We'll be happy to, to address them. And our next presentation is going to be uh, Dr. Wei Dong Lu from Dana-Farber um, Zakem Center, and he's going to be presenting a, a case, a specific case on um, acupuncture and um, head and neck um, cancer related dysphagia. So that should be a very um, rich presentation as well. So thank you all for coming again, um, and tell your friends, and I uh, hope we'll see you next month. So thanks again.